Hi, my name is Diane Rudolph. I'm a nurse practitioner and wound care specialist. I'm a certified wound ostomy incontinent nurse. And I thought what I would do in this particular program is maybe have a little fun with you and present a few case studies really to allow you to maybe use some of your critical thinking skills and see if maybe you have the same thoughts and answers about how to manage some of these chronic wounds as I do. So with that in mind, I'll go ahead and get started. So our objectives today would include describing the difference between acute and chronic wounds, describing the etiology and management of some of the common types of chronic wounds that you will see in your practices, discuss the concept of critical colonization as it relates to wound healing, and keep in mind that chronic wounds are wounds that do not heal along a normal wound healing trajectory. These wounds are often a symptom of an underlying chronic disease process. They are a symptom of an underlying condition such as diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, venous disease, immobility, chronic kidney disease. Anything that you can possibly consider as a chronic disease does have the potential in some cases to lead to a chronic wound that can be very difficult to heal. Patients that are immunocompromised or have nutritional deficits or infection may also be certainly at risk for the development of chronic wounds. So let's launch into our first case study here. In terms of the pertinent data, this is a gentleman who is 78 years old, long history of smoking, half a pack a day for many, many years. And as you evaluate him, you notice that his pulses are weak but palpable. Now he is ambulatory, he lives in an assisted living setting, he has very fragile skin and he's got a history of diabetes types 2. You notice that he has on his right lower extremity uh, a wound that's got moderate to copious serous exudates, no significant odor, the depth of the wound is about 0.8 centimeters, and it's located on his right medial malleolus. You'll also notice that this patient has a lot of dark discoloration to his skin in both extremities, a lot of hyperpigmentation. The skin looks to be a bit shiny and a little bit dry. So that makes you kind of wonder perhaps what might be going on with this patient. Here is a little bit of a closer evaluation and you can see that these wounds are certainly not deep but potentially very serious and the overall skin condition is not that healthy. So what is your initial impression of this patient? Do you think that he has peripheral vascular disease or diminished arterial supply to his legs? Could this be chronic venous hypertension? There is a lot of discoloration in his legs. Do, this, do you think this could be cellulitis or infection of the soft tissues? Or perhaps we are looking at something called irritant dermatitis. This is a patient with chronic venous hypertension with stasis dermatitis. Here is another example of a patient with a venous leg ulcer. Again, you can see an open full thickness wound. We have hemosiderin staining, that is that brown hyperpigmented tissue that we see in areas around the wound. If we were to look closely, we might see some little varicosity scattered throughout the leg. All of these are your classic signs and symptoms of what we call venous hypertension with an ulcer. This actually accounts for about 70 to 90% of all leg ulcers. Here is another example of a venous ulcer. And as you can see, it's very irregular in margins. These tend to drain quite a bit, and they can be quite a challenge to treat. So what should we do next? Should we, should we order or request to order non-invasive vascular studies? Should we culture the wounds and then start treatment with an antibiotic? Or is this severe enough to transfer to acute care for treatment of cellulitis? Or should we apply compression stockings to help with edema control? What do you think? We should try to order non-invasive vascular studies. 
This is a patient who has certainly some significant skin issues. He has venous hypertension. He also has a history of smoking. So he has more than likely some peripheral vascular disease and weak pulses. So he certainly would be at risk for problems with healing. And the reason that the non-invasive vascular studies are important is we want to really get an idea of how good is the circulation down to the feet and tissues, and are there any problems with the venous supply as well? Are there any problems with reflux or problems with any blood clots or other things that could be problematic? So you would want to order non-invasive vascular studies for this patient. And non-invasive vascular studies involve a series of different measurements, but one of the more important ones is called the ankle brachial index. That is where the ankle systolic pressure is divided by the brachial systolic pressure, and the normal would be 0.9 to 1.2. Anything less than that is, is indicative of some uh, arterial insufficiency. That is very, very important to know as well as the TBI. And in this case, this patient is diabetic, so the TBI, or toe brachial index, is also important to measure. The reason why that is important to measure is that with some diabetics, they can have calcification of their blood vessels. And so when the uh, ankle brachial index is done, the inability to compress those vessels may re lead to a false elevation in the ABI, and they may be more compromised than you think. So you always want to get an ABI, and if they're diabetic, you want to get a TBI as well. And this is just reviewing the pathophysiology of venous stasis disease. It is incompetence of the valves in the legs that results in reflux into the uh, venous system. You have high pressure that develops and is transferred from the deep venous system to the superficial venous system. You have multiple varicosities that develop. You also get extravasation of the red cells into the tissues causing hyperpigmentation and hemosiderin staining. So the standard of care for venous ulcers is compression. And that's one of the reasons why getting the ABI was very important because if he has mixed peripheral vascular disease along with the venous hypertension, it may be a contraindication to apply compression. So here would be again a few examples of some of the different compression products. There's a wide variety of compression products on the market. They're very comparable in terms of their purpose and goals and outcomes. And also available are stockings. Compression stockings can be very helpful and beneficial. Uh, neoprene wraps called ferrule wraps can be used, or in some cases a lymphedema pump can be also uh, part of the standard of care. And this is the application of a compression wrap from the base of the toe to just below the knee. So to summarize, venous ulcers include 75 or 70 to 90 percent of all lower extremity ulcers. They're usually associated with the family history of obesity, trauma, pregnancy, surgery, uh, occupations of, of being on your feet for prolonged periods of time. We typically see them in the gator area, that is the area between the knee and the ankle. And classic symptoms include hemosiderin staining, which is that dark hyperpigmentation, large amounts of exudate formation, the lipodermatosclerosis, or that firm, hard, doughy uh, feeling to the legs, dermatitis, sometimes some itching, ankle flare, which would be a flare of small blood vessels or, or broken capillaries around the ankle, and then champagne bottle deformity. Standard of care for treating venous ulcers is compression therapy if their ABI is within normal, in other words, if it's 0.8 or better, or they have a TBI of 0.6 or better. And usually because these wounds drain quite a bit, you would want to use an absorbent type of product with these patients. So dressing options might include a calcium alginate, a hydrofiber, a foam dressing, or even a polyacrylate, which is the diaper technology. Other benefits of compression is it really can help to improve the overall condition of the skin. This is a gentleman who had quite a bit of thick scaling plaques on his legs, some of which was probably a little bit of poor hygiene, chronic stasis dermatitis, and with just 
gentle wound care, uh, scrubbing, cleaning those legs, and application of compression, you can see that there's a significant difference uh, in the two pictures before and after. So compression can be extremely beneficial for these patients. So case study number two. Here we have a 77-year-old female. Her history is significant for obesity, diabetes. She has a history of a stroke or CVA with left hemiparesis. She's wheelchair bound. She had an acute onset of pain in her left lower extremity with low grade fever. Her white count was 11.2 with left shift, meaning there was an elevation in the neutrophils. She was complaining of malaise and general discomfort. She just didn't feel good. And her AccuCheck's had been elevated for the last few days. This is what she looks like. And as you can see, her left leg is very, very erythematous. It looks very exquisitely painful. If you were to palpate it, it would probably be very hot or warm to the touch. So certainly we know that there is a problem here. What do you think that problem is? Do you think this patient has cellulitis or inflammation or infection of the soft tissues? Does she have lymphedema or venous hypertension? Could it be something as remote as filariasis? Or do you think this is just unfortunately a complication of her morbid obesity? Or do you think that there might be more than one issue at stake here? I'll give you a moment to think about that. This particular lady is suffering from both cellulitis and lymphedema. Lymphedema is a, a very unfortunate and difficult type of uh, injury to manage. It is different from venous ulcers. It is a defect of the lymphatic system. And you can have hereditary or acquired lymphedema. And in this particular case, this was uh, hereditary lymphedema. This patient has really suffered with this on and off for most of her life. And when you have failure of the lymphatic circulation to, to work as it should, you get the collection of a lot of edema in the interstitial tissues. And over time, it creates this chronic problem, this chronic uh, deformation of the legs. And one of the big problems with patients who have lymphedema is they're very, very prone to recurrent cellulitis. And that's kind of what we're seeing here is this, this poor lady has unfortunately developed another episode of cellulitis. So what are our treatment options? We have a lady with morbid obesity. She has lymphedema and she has some cellulitis in her legs. So what are our treatment options? Do we want to treat the infection? Do we want to consider compression, which might include compression wraps, pneumatic pumps, or what are also called lymphedema pumps? There's also something called manual lymphatic drainage, which actually requires certified therapists who can actually physically uh, massage and uh, help the uh, lymphatic tissue to migrate. Skin care, is that a concern? And should we think about other possible causes or etiologies involved in this case? This patient has basically something called, uh, she has cellulitis, and she really has something called lymphedema. Sometimes it's called phlebolymphedema if there's also a concern about venous stasis disease. And one of the things that helps to distinguish lymphedema from the edema of venous stasis disease or the edema of heart failure or other types of edema is actually something called a stemmer sign. And that's actually a very simple thing to look for. If you were to look at this picture at the base of the patient's first and second toe, you can see a big pinch or fold of skin. That is called stemmer's sign, S-T-E-M-M-E-R-S, -E -M -M -E stemmer sign. That is indicative of lymphedema. And in this case, she actually really has mixed disease. She's got features of both venous uh, disease here as well as a, an open ulcerated area. So the treatment for that particular patient would include compression therapy and treatment of any kind of an open wound with appropriate absorbent therapies 
and again getting with the provider responsible for the patient uh, in terms of ordering an antibiotic to help treat the infection. Case study number three involves a 90-year-old male with a history of dementia of the Alzheimer's type. He's seven plus on his FAST score. He's immobile. He's total care. He was admitted to the emergency room after being found down at home. Elderly wife is unable to care for him. And he was treated with pneumonia and then transferred to the post-acute care for rehabilitation and wound care. And this is what he looks like. So is this a stage two pressure injury, a stage three pressure injury, a stage four pressure injury, a Kennedy ulcer, or none of the above? This is a stage four pressure injury. And again, if we go back, we can see this is an open full thickness wound. We can see the depth and the base of the wound. And if you were to examine this wound, you would notice that there's extensive undermining all the way throughout. There is some necrotic tissue, but because we can visualize the base of the wound and we can see some exposed muscle, we know that this is indeed a stage four pressure injury. So pressure injuries are a result of compression of soft tissue between two hard surfaces. It's an area of localized damage due to unrelieved pressure. The tissues become very ischemic and they collapse and we end up with tissue that is no longer viable. These can progress very, very quickly depending on the overall health of the host. And in a situation like this with this 90-year-old, this was probably something that evolved very, very quickly, maybe over a course of perhaps days to weeks. Common pressure points for pressure injuries would include any of the bony prominences or any tissue underneath uh, a piece of clothing or a medical device. The most common areas are generally the sacrum and the heels. But also keep in mind that patients that sit for prolonged periods of time may also have ischial ulcers. So what orders would you either write or what, would you, what orders would you try to obtain uh, for this particular patient? I'll let you think about that for a moment. We've got a stage four pressure injury. So we need to think about what type of care is going to be required. So what orders would you write if you were the provider? What orders would you request if you were one of the nurses or clinicians taking care of this patient? Appropriate topical therapy would be very important for this patient. It's an open, full thickness wound with some dead space and tunneling. You would want a pressure redistribution surface. You would want a specialty bed for this patient. Offloading devices, perhaps to mitigate any more pressure on the heels. A Foley, that might be a consideration, especially with a wound this big and this extensive. Nutritional consult, absolutely. And depending on the overall goals of care and what the family desires, uh, perhaps a plastics or a general surgery consult may be indicated. Uh, but again, it's going to depend on what the goals of care are. Do we want to be aggressive with this patient and send them for a flap and prolonged um, hospital course? Or do we want to just try to treat them with aggressional nutri aggressive nutritional interventions and appropriate topical therapy? Our goals of care here need to be very clearly defined. Is this aggressive care? Is this palliative care? Or is it something in between? And then that begs the question, because this comes up quite a bit, are all pressure injuries unavoidable? Is it possible with good care to prevent every single pressure injury that happens? There's a lot of different schools of thought about that. In a, an NPUAP consensus panel of experts, the answers were that 100% of the uh, experts felt that uh, are all pressure ulcers avoidable? No. Are most pressure ulcers avoidable? Yes. And if enough pressure was removed from the external body, could the skin always survive? And 100% said no. 
So there is a white paper also out that really begs the question. And in terms of avoidable versus unavoidable pressure ulcers, we recognize, or pressure injuries, we recognize that even under optimal care, sometimes the patient can be so compromised that even with optimal care, they may still develop pressure injuries. And those are what we refer to as uh, unavoidable, that nothing else really could have been done to have saved that patient's skin. Now, if it's a situation where the patient didn't receive the benefit of appropriate turning or repositioning, or the wound care wasn't done according to orders or on a consistent basis, or the patient um, perhaps was refusing care, or perhaps <clears throat> maybe the patient uh, the patient's family didn't agree with the plan of care, certainly some of those factors might come into play. But an unavoidable ulcer or pressure injury is one in which you have all of the appropriate care in place and you still have the development of a wound. Okay, case study number four. Pertinent data for this patient includes the fact that he is a, an older gentleman. He has diabetes, peripheral arterial disease, and stage renal disease. He ambulates with a roller. He is an assisted living resident. He has a wound with scant serous exudate, no odor. The depth is about 0.3 centimeters, and it's located on the right plantar foot at the first metatarsal head. And here is a little bit of a close-up, and you can see there is a large amount of hyperkeratotic tissue that has developed in the peri-wound area. So what do you think this is? Is this a pressure ulcer of the great toe? Is this a traumatic or puncture wound? Again, keep in mind that many patients with diabetes don't have good sensation, so sometimes they can certainly end up with trauma. Is it a neuropathic ulcer? Or is it a margillans ulcer? This is a neuropathic ulcer, and because this patient is diabetic, we also could refer to it as a diabetic foot ulcer. Here are some other examples. Again, with the diabetic foot ulcers, they can occur anywhere on the plantar surface of the foot. They are a direct result of a loss of protective sensation to the foot. And on this one, you can see this is a pretty extensive wound, full thickness. Uh, you can also see a little bit of hyperkeratotic tissue around the peri-wound area as well. Here is another example. One of the big problems that we see with patients who have diabetes is they may end up with an ulcer on their toe or their foot, and sometimes over time, because of difficulty with healing, they may be susceptible to losing a part or portions of their foot. And whenever that happens, it causes redistribution of the pressure points and puts them at greater risk for the development of additional ulcers. And this is an example where that definitely turned out to be the case. So management. What would you want to do for these patients in terms of taking care of the diabetic foot ulcer? What would be some important considerations to keep in mind? Absolutely assess for loss of protective sensation. And that can be done using the uh, SEMS-Weinstein monofilament. If there is hyperkeratotic tissue, it's got to be debrided or paired off because that just becomes an area of greater pressure and can make the ulcer worse. You want to provide local wound care and appropriate options might be a hydrogel, collagen, or perhaps MediHoney. Offload, offload, offload. Again, these patients need to get pressure off of those wounds in order for them to heal. So after debridement, there's a nice clean wound here. And this is just to review the use of the monofilament to assess for protective sensation. This is a really important component of assessment. And for any patient that has diabetes, at least upon admission or at least upon an initial evaluation, it certainly would be a great idea to become comfortable with the use of the monofilament and to use these to screen for um, sensory loss in these patients. A couple of examples of offloading, including the uh, DH walker and the rocker bottom boot that help to redistribute pressure so there's not as much pressure on the forefoot when they're walking. 
And total contact casting is certainly also uh, appropriate as part of the standard of care. Usually this is something that is done in wound care centers, um, but sometimes patients can be sent out and managed at a wound care clinic for something like this. So in summary, uh, neuropathic ulcers occur on the plantar surface of the foot. They are variable in depth. It's important to address the underlying disease. The diabetic control, the glycemic control is important. If it's caused by another factor, a nutritional deficit such as B12 deficiency or another type of neurological issue, that needs to be addressed as well. To breed the hyperkeratotic tissue, offload pressure. Again, that's extremely important. Any infection that's in present needs to be addressed. And you want to certainly incorporate the concept of moist wound healing.